Hey, what's up, everybody? We're so glad you've joined us today. I'm Josh Eason, and welcome to Message in the Music. And we have a great show for you today with some very special guests. And this husband and wife duo are from our little country hometown in Oliver Springs, and they are a power couple for the kingdom of God. They have an amazing worship ministry, and I know you're going to love them. So please help me welcome Michael and Tybee Jester as they lead us in worship today.
Let's get into the Word today. I want to first encourage you that God has amazing destiny and a great plan for your life. But I also want to share with us some things that can hinder or keep us from God's promises in our lives. The first thing is sin. Doing evil in God's sight. Proverbs 13 and 19 says, It is pleasant to see dreams come true, but fools refuse to turn from evil to attain them. The second thing to be on guard against is doubt and unbelief. Hebrews 3 and 16 and 18 through 19 says, And who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard His voice? And to whom was God speaking when He took an oath that they would never enter His rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed Him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter into His rest. And the third thing that will keep you from God's promises in your life, and it's what I've been instructed to share with you today, and that's this complaining. If my sermon had a title, it would be called this, Complain and Remain, Praise and Be Raised. Numbers 14, 27 through 30 says this, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Some of the most quoted and miraculous demonstrations of God's power were on the behalf of children of Israel. He sent ten different plagues against Pharaoh. He led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Gave them fresh manna every day. He parted the Red Sea, gave them water from a rock, turned the bitter water into sweet water. And when they got tired of eating manna, God sent miles and miles of quail three feet deep for them to eat for an entire month. One statistician ran some numbers based on the size of the camp. The number of people and quail three feet high off the ground, he concluded this, there were approximately 105 million quail that came into the camp. God also gave them victory in many battles, yet they still continued to complain. It seemed like all that God had done for them was never good enough. My question to us is, doesn't that sound familiar? Hasn't God done the exact same things in our lives, given us victories, supplied our needs, saved our souls, freed us from bondage, healed our hearts and our bodies. And yet when we face another obstacle or trial, we tend to revert back to complaining. Well, today God wants to take us higher. But in order to do that, we're going to have to grow and mature because God's more interested in who we're becoming rather than where we are going or how big our dreams are. Pastor Gerald McGinnis once said this, God is more concerned about our character than he is our comfort or our career. Now, one good indicator that we're not ready for the next level is when we complain. John Acuff once said this, Complaining is like vomiting. 
Afterwards, you feel better, but everyone else around you feels sick. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's a difference in casting your care upon the Lord and complaining against Him. It's all a matter of the posture of your heart. God wants and desires and loves to hear from His children. But that's not what the children of Israel were doing. They were rebelling in their hearts while they were complaining. God desires that we surrender our hearts while we cast our care upon Him. Another word for complaining is doubt or unbelief. If we really had faith in God and believed He would do what He promised He would do, why would we ever complain? Complaining against God only shows where our heart is. It can really be like a smack in the face or biting the hand that feeds you when we doubt and complain against God. By God's miraculous hand, the children of Israel came out of bondage, but the bondage never came out of them. In other words, the Israelites left the wilderness, but the wilderness never left them. That's because they were still in captivity in their minds. On several different occasions now, God has gently rebuked me and said, Your thinking is way too small. So my new prayer has been this. God, I don't want to have a wilderness mentality when I have a promised land destiny. And I don't want to have a negative attitude or mentality that causes my destiny to be delayed or to be hindered. Or let me say it like this. I don't want an 11-day journey to take me 40 years like it did the children of Israel. As I said before, I grew up loving Michael Jordan in sports. So when a new documentary was released on the Chicago Bulls recently, I was in heaven. There was a story on one of those episodes in the documentary about how the Chicago Bulls could never win a championship because of their arch rival, the Detroit Pistons. And in an interview, Horace Grant of the Chicago Bulls said this, During the time that the Pistons reigned over us, every time that they would do something, we would complain to the referee, or we would try to get back at them. Michael Jordan also said in that interview, Horace used to get beaten up so bad, and he would go back whining, and I would tell him, don't whine, don't whine, don't let them see you whine. That's when they know they've got you. Horace Grant replied and said, with the Pistons being more mentally dominant than we were, they knew as soon as we started complaining, they had us, and they knew they did. Now that statement right there shook me because it made me realize that not only does God hear you complain, but so does your enemy. And he can use those complaints as a weapon against you. The documentary goes on to show how finally the Bulls year came and all of the guys on the team had matured. They developed mentally, physically, and emotionally. And they were hungry and ready to win a championship. But the time came for them to face their arch rival, Detroit Pistons, in the playoffs. In order for them to make the championship and to go to the final championship series, they had to go past the Pistons. They made a great start and beat the Pistons for the first three games. They only had to win one more game to move to the next level and play the L.A. Lakers for the championship. In that final game, the Bulls were winning and the Pistons knew it was all over. Scottie Pippen, who played for the Bulls, went up for a layup and was crushed by his opponent and pushed down to the ground. Scottie found himself laying in the front row of the stands. That's how hard he was fouled, and it could have severely injured him. Oh, but this time it was different. Scottie set himself up, gathered himself, took a few deep breaths, and went about his business like nothing had ever happened. He didn't go complain to the ref or try to fight with his opponent. He just went straight to the foul line and shot his free throws and never responded to the blatant attack. Michael Jordan said in that interview, When Scotty didn't respond to the abuse, there was nothing the Pistons could do to beat us at that point. Detroit Pistons teammate in that documentary, John Sally, said this, Scotty was unshakable. He didn't even want a band-aid when he got pushed down. When we saw that, it was over. Not only did the Bulls make it past the Pistons that year, but they won the entire NBA championship. Romans 12 and 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
That Chicago Bulls story is a great example of that scripture. So remember, new mindset, new victories. In Numbers chapter 13, Moses sent out 12 scouts to survey the land that God had promised them so they could bring back a report to him. Now two of those scouts were Joshua and Caleb. Scripture said that they said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Numbers 14, 7 through 9. As it turns out, Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of the 12 that came back with a good report. The other 10 reported back that it indeed was a good land filled with great things. But there were giants in the land. And they said that we look like grasshoppers compared to them. They said we can't go up against them because they are so much stronger than we are. And we're going to be devoured. Their negative report caused panic in the whole entire community. And everyone started protesting against Moses and Aaron. So you had two different completely reports. Completely opposite reports. Joshua and Caleb saying, we're well able. God is with us and we will devour them. And then you had the other ten saying, it's impossible. It's too great for us. We're too small. We will be defeated and I know we'll be devoured. Well, here's what happened. God said in Deuteronomy 1 and 35, Not one of you from this wicked generation will live to see the good land I swore to give your ancestors. So Joshua and Caleb were the only two from that generation to enter the promised land because they trusted and followed God fully by reporting back in verse 30 of that same chapter saying, We are well able to overcome it and take the land God has promised us. Now you may be up against some giants in your own life that you think are going to devour and destroy you. But please let me remind you that God is with you and He is for you. And greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. I want you to say these words after me. I am well able. Come on, say it out loud. I am well able. Now, if you do ministry with me at all, you'll hear these words a lot. And I don't tend to say them when the road is smooth. I have to make myself say them when things aren't going as planned or whenever I'm afraid or fearful of the task at hand. There was a time many years ago when I first began ministry and I was feeling so overwhelmed and very inadequate by what God was calling me to do and asking me to do. I was really discouraged one day and was sitting on the couch in my living room in prayer. And with tears rolling down my face, my phone rang and it was my mama. And she said these words, Joshua, I wanted to call you and read something to you. She began reading by saying these words, you are well able. She went on to read several paragraphs that sounded very familiar to me. It was very encouraging and gave me the strength I needed. And it was an answer to prayer in my time of doubt. The funny thing was, it was a document that my mom was reading, and it was my own sermon that I'd written several months prior that she had found. She saw it on her computer and was reading it and felt compelled to call me and read it back to me. So God used my own sermon message to encourage me. Now I pray it does the exact same thing for you because you are truly well able. Understand that Joshua and Caleb obtained the promise not just because they did not complain, but because they believed God's promise, followed Him wholeheartedly, and the Bible said that they had an excellent spirit. The book of Daniel chapter 6 verse 3 says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. So the king made plans to set him over the whole kingdom. Verse 4 says, No corruption or negligence could be found in Daniel. He was moral, he was faithful, and he was trustworthy. I don't know about you, but I want to carry an excellent spirit like Joshua, Caleb, and Daniel so that I can be ready to receive all that God has promised me. An excellent spirit will not only cause you to prosper, but it will cause people to want to surround you, be good to you, and help you go further. My question to you would be, what kind of spirit do you carry? Do people want to see you coming or do they want to see you going? I want them to get excited when they see me. I want them to miss my spirit when I'm not around. I want them to say, oh good, thank God. 
Josh is here. Not, oh Lord, here comes Josh. Josh is here. I was blessed to have a great conversation with one of my mentors, Pastor John P. Key, one time. And he said something that really stuck with me. He said, Josh, it's your spirit that you carry that will impact and bless others long after you've stepped off stage. We should pray as Daniel did when he prayed. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 15-16 talks about how God uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. I remember one time I was angry and in self-pity and honestly throwing a three-year-old spiritual temper tantrum. And I remember God speaking to me ever so gently saying, Your attitude is a stench in my nostrils. You talk about getting my attention quickly. I immediately stopped what I was doing and repented and asked God to forgive me. I want my life to be a sweet aroma in the nostrils of God. Understand this. It's your attitude, not your DNA, that will determine your quality of life. One of the greatest decisions you can make on a day-to-day basis is your choice of attitude. It is more important than your past, your education, your bank account, successes or failures, circumstances or position, and it's certainly more important than what others think of you. Your attitude will keep you going or it will cripple your progress. It alone will fuel your fire or assault your hope. Our lives will be different when we determine to have an attitude of gratitude. And just like love, gratitude is not a feeling. It's a choice. And the choice is up to us whether or not we will be thankful in all circumstances or if we will murmur and complain in the midst of them. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. That's all the time that we have for this week. But before we go, we always want to give you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Listen, we're all looking for answers, but we can stop searching because Jesus Christ doesn't have the answers. He is the answer. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. I've tried it on my own, but now I'm asking you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I receive your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. Thank you for making me whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we pray this show has been a blessing to you in some way, and we can't wait to see you next week at this same time for another episode of Message and Music. And always remember to dream big. Thank you for watching today's episode. Our broadcast is a viewer-supported ministry, and without your contribution, this show would not be possible. If you would like to help us continue our television ministry, here are some ways that you can donate. Thank you in advance for your prayers and support, and we pray you have a blessed week.